everybody. New tools for old problems. This is a pretty generic title. I didn't want to scare the organizers, but this is what I actually wanted to call my talk. <laughs> and so I'm going to explain a little bit more. But the theme of this talk is around tools. It's around ethics. It's about it's a, a preview into what I've been thinking about a lot recently to do with these two things when you put them together. And so before we start, I want to give you a quick pop quiz. I'm sorry, I know it's early. Um, but can anybody tell me this Unicode code point right here? <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> uh, I'll put you out of your misery. This is the code point here. And so this is the international symbol of accessibility. And I want to sort of give you a little bit of a historic walkthrough of this. And I want to talk to you about an artist who has inspired me um, to do the work that I've been doing lately in my personal time. So this woman here, uh, she's from New York, and she's a personal hero of mine. Her name is Sarah Hendren, and she's an artist, a researcher, and a designer. And she looked at this international accessibility symbol, which has been around um, for a very long time now, and something just seemed off to her. And so her um, and also a partner, Brian Glennie, on the project, um, they went ahead and created the Accessible Icon Project. And this project has gone from just being an artistic statement to a global movement, which is just incredible. And so Sarah looked at this icon and she saw a number of things that were wrong with this icon. Um, and she wanted to redesign it to actually properly represent um, accessibility with more focus on the person. And so when she talked to the press about this project, she said that they felt the old symbol was stiff and robotic, with the chair functioning as part of, but not a tool for the human. And so she wanted to emphasize the person and emphasize them as an active representation. So you can see the pose is very different. You can clearly um, separate the person from the wheelchair. Um, and a, a funny fact about this is when the original logo was designed, uh, it didn't actually have um, the, the head. It was actually just a picture of the wheelchair. And um, before it was adopted as the international symbol, they felt that it was too abstract and that people wouldn't understand what the symbol was just by looking at it alone. And so you'll now note that there's this odd sort of the arms are very, very low down if that was a human and it just doesn't quite make sense. And so what they did was they extended the top of the wheelchair and they just put a circle on the top to try and turn that into a person. So it still wasn't even an ideal logo from the beginning. It really did kind of merge the person in the wheelchair, and people just haven't felt like that's a very accurate representation of themselves for accessibility. And so um, the two of them redesigned the logo, and they wanted to make a statement and um, make this logo more well-known. And so they developed a kit that allowed you to basically do guerrilla um, art or graffiti around the city. And they had stickers and they had stencils. And you could basically, if you supported this new logo, you could go and you could paper over the existing logos in the city. And so it became this kind of guerrilla movement of um, guerrilla art. And so here is a, a picture of them um, creating a new accessibility um, parking spot uh, stencil and they're getting kids involved, which is super fun. <laughs> and after a while, this actually picked up a lot of traction. So uh, New York City has taken this and adopted it officially. And so uh, the Instagram account for the Accessibility Icon Project, you should check it out. It has all of these photos of the logo existing in the wild, which is really cool. And it's not just New York City that has adopted it. Other places have adopted it. I think the picture on the right is from North Carolina. But here's the thing, the modified um, symbol is, has not been adopted or endorsed by the US Access Board. And um, similarly, the International Organization for Standardization, the ISA, which established the original icon for use, which 
uh, just a little factoid, is ISO 7001. Uh, it, they have also rejected the new design, which is pretty sad. However, the uh, modified ISA, uh, as well as the um, different um, permutations of the street art graffiti, are actually in a permanent collection in the Museum of Modern Art, which I think is really cool. And if you've used an iPhone recently, or if you have an iPhone, uh, Apple have actually adopted this icon as well, which is really exciting to see. So this is the actual code point Unicode representation on an iPhone. So I thought that was awesome. So I found this really, really inspiring, this idea of guerrilla art to really affect change and to um, elevate voices behind this icon that haven't been heard before. And so Sarah Hendren is incredibly influential to me. Uh, I highly recommend that you read uh, her written works. I am going to share some of the quotes from her written works today just to explore this topic further. But that's definitely where to start. Uh, if you Google her name, you'll end up on her website, which is ableist. So I want to start with this one, which is, I think even a purist would agree that there are network-enhanced extensive tools that we are using now that outpace even a provisional, context-specific ethics or a grounded understanding about how to use them and about their ripple effects. So we're going to revisit this quote in a minute, but I think that's incredibly relevant to us in tech right now. The stakes at hand include human agency and uh, passivity, even if it is impossible to understand the scale of human machine changes with confident historical perspective. Now, you'll notice there's a, there's a weird word in there, which is human machine. And that's because this is um, Sarah writing about cyborg culture and prosthetics and about the culture of people who need prosthetics and who make cyborgs of themselves actually needing access to that. And the, uh, the cool culture of cyborgs kind of combining. But if we go back to the original quote, I think that there's something um, particularly of focus in here, which is network enhanced extensive tools that we are using now that outpace even a provisional context-specific ethics. And so, I don't know about you, but it might have been about cyborgs, <laughs> but I see this coming in through machine learning and through our use of it these days, and through seeing some of the damage that machine learning has already caused for us. So, I wanted to look at machine learning and look how, at how powerful it is and look at the ethics of it, and I wanted to see what that would mean in combination with, instead of just guerrilla art, what would guerrilla accessibility look like? What would improving accessibility for people on the web, what kind of guerrilla tactics could we use, given that the web is so big, we may be getting better at accessibility now, but there is, there's so much content out there already that isn't accessible that may never get revisited or repaired. And so I wanted to look into and explore the notions around that. And the reason for this is that I tend to think about code as um, creating the outcome of something instead of the code itself. And uh, I have a friend who can actually put this in words much better than me. And uh, Rachel Simone Weil recently in one of her talks, Art After Dark, said, for me, coding has always been a critical design tool to help me ask, what if? If the tool doesn't do that, frankly, I don't find it that interesting. To me, it's like being interested in a paintbrush without being interested in art, or being interested in a guitar, but not being interested in music. And when she said those words, I got goosebumps because this is exactly what I try and do when I create code. Sure, I care about syntax, I care about writing code well, but I care much more about what the code has actually put out into the world. What was the outcome of that code? What is the effect that our code has actually had on people who don't actually see the code behind the scenes? So lately, I've been asking myself that exact question a lot, what if? And so I wanted to share with you some experiments um, that I've started doing to explore this question of what if there was guerrilla accessibility. So I decided what would happen if you took cross-side scripting and you mixed that together with machine learning to try and improve accessibility. Uh, what would that experiment look like? So I want to show you a couple of ideas just to show you where I'm going with this. Um, this is a continuing journey, but I want you to also think about 
how you can use machine learning technology in your everyday job to perhaps improve things that you didn't think you could improve before. So my first project uh, that I did recently is called Instacaption. So uh, when you're trying to make an image accessible on the internet, you use what's called alt text, and that's using the alt attribute on an image. So if you have a picture of a cat on a Roomba, you describe it as, as such. This is a cat sitting on a Roomba looking at a camera. On Instagram, the whole website is full of user-generated content, right? And so there is no way for um, Instagram to ensure that everyone is creating an appropriate caption. Some images are uploaded with no captions because the uh, user wants it to be moody. Sometimes they'll just completely not even write the correct description of the image at all because it's up to them what they write. They, they are the curator of their account. And so often the alt tags are incorrect or they're not helpful or they're just completely not there at all. Uh, and so I wrote a bookmarklet that basically is supposed to be an exploration of you being able to hijack a website. And what it does is once you click it, it will take every single image, uh, it will perform machine learning on it, and it will bring back a caption, which you can see in the logs. And it actually takes that caption and um, inserts it into every single image tag on the site and, and appends the alt text so that it becomes more accessible. So I'm not going to walk through the code because we don't have time for that, but I wanted to show you that it took tw 20, less than 25 lines of code to do. Uh, I did end up adding some mutation observers so that when you infinitely scroll on Instagram, it will then pick up the new images and fetch captions for those two. But that's the main guts of it. It's a fetch request. You can use machine learning APIs these days that um, are custom vision APIs. Um, so I'm using the one from Microsoft, but there are ones from Google and IBM as well. And it basically just fetches it and then um, you know, mutates the image and puts the, the attribute in there. At the same time, coincidentally, the same week, um, my colleague actually created a demo where you can upload an image and you can get back some alt text to use. And uh, that's Sarah Drasner, and I think that was a really, really cool exploration as well, just showing the power of, of how we can use custom vision not to do dodgy things, but we can do it to actually help people. So the next project that I did was uh, live closed caption injection. So I've been working on this for a really long time. Uh, speech recognition is a very nuanced thing, which I discovered. Um, so uh, it was briefly mentioned in my intro that I live code on Twitch. And I live code every single Sunday, uh, except this Sunday, because I will be traveling. But um, I basically just show what it's like maintaining open source online. And here's the thing. Um, I get captions done for all my YouTube videos because it's affordable. It's not affordable to get real-time captioning, at least for me. Uh, and I really don't like that I'm leaving people out of being able to watch my stream if they need closed captions. So I thought, what if I take the closed caption container that Twitch already has that I don't have access to software that can actually send those captions? Uh, and then what if I create a custom speech recognition model for Australian American English which was very frustrating for me because I don't have a typical accent. I don't really have an Australian accent. I don't really have an American accent. It's kind of a mix of in between. So I had to actually take hours of me speaking, um, generate transcripts for it, and then use that to train a custom model in order to recognize my speech. Um, and so the experiments so far have been really great. Um, what happens is it records my voice and it streams it to a WebSocket, and at the other end of that WebSocket is a speech recognition model, and then it returns that caption back, and then I can then inject it in my Twitch stream. Luckily for me, as I got halfway through hacking this uh, with cross-site scripting, they released an extension um, tool where you can actually build real extensions for Twitch now, and so that actually fits in way better. I don't have to hack the site anymore. People don't have to use a Chrome extension or something like that to get captions on my feed. It's available to everyone, which is really cool. So I'm excited to pursue that a little bit longer. I just need to make the accuracy of it a little bit better because I'm still working on training that model to understand the tech jargon that I mentioned and things like that. Um, but I think that's a really, really positive uh, way of using speech recognition. Um, rather than using it for things like my voice is my password, which has very mixed results. Um, so that's another experiment of mine. But here's the thing, these are just one-offs, right? The, these are just small experiments that I'm doing, but how do you get these things to, to scale? Like, how do you, 
How do you try and like try and address everything on the internet at once and 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 use these tools at web scale? Well, I have an idea. Uh, I'm not. 100% completed. I just started thinking about it recently and um, trying to figure out exactly how you would do this. But does anybody uh, remember SETI at home? A couple of people? You may have had it installed on your computer. So for those who don't know, um, SETI at home was an amazing project that SETI, which is the search for extraterrestrial um, life, you know, it was, it's like a publicly, it was a publicly funded uh, agency. They had a lot of data that they'd collected, right? A lot of radio, um, radio astronomy data, and they were trying to look at those frequencies for signs of life. And so what you could do was, if you weren't using your computer, you could download a screensaver that, and this is what the screensaver actually looked like, you could use a screensaver in order to start crunching all of the raw data that they had, um, and your computer would analyze all the frequencies and see if it found any source of weirdness that might be life uh, outside of Earth. And it would give you things like the data info, you can see in the, the um, screen grab there, it, it wasn't just some boring thing, it actually looked really cool. And so while you weren't using your computer, you turn the screensaver on and it would do that. So I thought, what would happen if you just asked the world to use their computer when it was idle in order to crunch all of the images on the internet or all of the videos that don't have captions and you could be generating that content and putting it up in some central database where we could actually go back and repair all of those websites. Like, could I make a screensaver made of JavaScript that could actually do that? And I think that's a, a really cool idea. And so instead of using this kind of idle CPU or GPU time for something like Bitcoin mining, <laughs> I thought, what if we use it for guerrilla accessibility and we can all come together and actually like, make things better? So I'm still exploring that. Uh, I will report back with the results <laughs> later on, maybe next year. So I guess what I'm saying is that new tech should find ways to assist. It shouldn't be ignoring or widening the gap of access that we already have. You know, machine learning has, has already made a lot of mistakes, or we've made a lot of mistakes with it. We've caused harm to real people. We've used it for things like monetary gain and trying to play the stock market game with it. And I just think that we have such a huge missed opportunity. And going back to my alternative title, if we keep going down this path and, and making these super naive mistakes and causing danger to everybody, then that might get taken away from us, that privilege of just being able to get out of bed every day and just write machine learning models could be taken away from us. And I think that that would be a huge tragedy given how much this technology can assist people. So what I'm saying is let's, let's not mess it up. Let's, let's try and use it positively and let's try and get that message out so people can be aware that this is a technology that we need to keep. And so I'm gonna end on another Sarah Hendren quote because I love her so much. But I want you to think about accessibility. Rethink the default bodily experience. There is no default bodily experience. We are all so different. And if we can rethink that, then we can start to repair the web for good. Thank you. Yeah.